SkardFarm.com. This is North Country Public Radio. It's 8 o'clock. This is Northern Light for Tuesday, June 25th. Good morning, I'm Monica Sandreski. It is primary day. Polls are open until 9. Few contested races, some key ones though. Details ahead. Also, school districts must switch their bus fleets to electric by 2035. Many voters have rejected plans to buy them. Many districts worry they won't meet their needs. We have multiple buses that run midday, whether it's two miles to Seaway Tech or to pick up a foster child in a district up to 50 miles away. This bus couldn't do that. And if we had to transition 100% to all electric buses, we wouldn't function. Also, a North Country transplant is trying to promote the region's restaurants, hikes, gift shops, and stores. She thinks of her app as the Chamber of Commerce for the Park. The Adirondack is a community, and and it's not easy to live in the Adirondacks, especially year-round. And so the app, to me, is just one way of trying to make it as easy for those of us who live there all year-round as possible. And we'll wrap up the show with a peek at the Ottawa Jazz Festival underway now. And so we have this late night series where we put a lot of stuff that could be danceable is, you know, maybe not sit down jazz, but is hip, right? So Butcher Brown, Hunter Tones are on that stage. We've got a preview and much more coming up on Northern Light. Stick with us. Support for Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio comes from the Adirondack Foundation, connecting people, ideas, and resources to improve lives and expand opportunities throughout the Adirondack region. Details at adirondackfoundation.org. And by Long Run Wealth, an SEC-registered investment advisor, providing comprehensive wealth management, retirement, and financial uh, financial planning solutions. Longrunwealth.com. This is Northern Light. I'm Monica Sandreski. It's primary day across New York State. While there aren't many races happening in the North Country, a few of them are notable. NCPR intern Zach Jaworski has more. In the city of Plattsburgh, three Democrats are running for mayor. Assistant District Attorney Dan Lennon and County Legislator Wendell Hughes will appear on the ballot. Iris Kane is also running as a write-in candidate. There are also two city council races for Democrats. Republicans in southwestern Jefferson County, including part of the city of Watertown, are deciding if incumbent Claudia Tenney will run for a second term in New York's 24th congressional district. She is being challenged by Geneva entrepreneur Mario Fratto. Jefferson County is also holding two municipal Republican primaries, one for the town of Familia's town council and the other for the town of Rutland's Justice. Also happening around the North Country, the town of Mariah's Republicans in Essex County will select their candidate for town council. And in Warren County, Republicans in Stony Creek will choose a candidate for town council. St. Lawrence, Hamilton, Lewis, and Franklin counties don't have any primaries this time around. Polls are open from 6 in the morning to 9 tonight. You're only eligible to participate in these primaries if you are registered with the party holding them. I'm Zach Jaworski for North Country Public Radio in Canton. In 2027, just three years from now, New York school districts will no longer be allowed to buy conventional gas or diesel buses. They'll have to buy electric buses and fully transition their fleets by 2035. 
no exceptions. It's the strictest such mandate in the United States, and it's part of New York's aggressive carbon emission goals to help reverse climate change. Despite pushback from Republican lawmakers, school districts, and local voters, Governor Kathy Hochul is standing behind the electric bus mandate. Here she is earlier this month. Sometimes it's an education process where people understand. I know school districts and voters don't want to be told what to do, but this is for the children's health now and into the future. So there's an education process that has to continue. Uh, The state can help at even greater levels to help these school districts meet these demands. Again, it's about our children. The voters she's talking about are in local school districts voting on bus purchases during the school budget process. Voters across the state, including here in the North Country, have rejected electric buses on the ballot. Amy Feireisel has more. Sean DeLorme Jr. is 26 years old, and he likes a diesel school bus. You know, I might be young, but I'm old school. I, I enjoy a diesel bus, you know, because it, it works. And if something works, I hate changing it. DeLorme is the transportation supervisor at Edwards Knox Central School District. We were like everybody else when the state mandate came around, uh, against it. But because it's state law, DeLorme says his district got to work and identified three bus routes that could comfortably go electric. Then they started applying for grants, and they got one from the state education department. It brings the price of an electric bus down to what a diesel one costs, $180,000. All this work was starting to prove off. Uh, we were we were getting the grants, you know, in air quote, free money, you know, so it doesn't come out of our current budget. The last hurdle was getting the purchase okayed in this year's school budget vote. Beforehand, DeLorme says they had their bus rep attend some local meetings. To talk about how and why we're doing this, you know, even though you might be against it, it's state law. But on voting day, May 21st, all that hard work didn't pay off. Um, it was shot down by three votes. The rest of the school budget was approved, but voters rejected the electric bus with 76 yeses and 79 noes. Tim White lives in Russell and is a parent in the district. I voted against it. I believe it would be a waste of money. He says local mechanics don't know how to work on electric buses, and he has very little confidence in the buses working in the winter. I would love to see him go to a diesel electric if you want to go to a hybrid where it could run off diesel if it has to, that would be a better option to look at. White's beef with electric buses is actually quite similar to DeLorme's, that the current electric bus technology doesn't fill all the needs of Edwards Knox 255-square-mile district. The state's position is that electric school buses are the future and are safer for kids because they don't emit pollutants. Governor Kathy Hochul said in 2022 that switching to electric vehicles is crucial to helping reduce climate emissions. We are really putting our foot down the accelerator and revving up our efforts to make sure we have this transition, not someday in the future, but on a specific date, a specific year, by the year 2035. State officials say that technology is improving quickly and that electric does work for things like daily bus runs. And that's where districts should start, the way Edwards Knox was planning to. I asked White what his school district should do, stuck between state law and local voters. I'm thinking they're going to have to talk with our elected personnel as their laws aren't working up here. The people are speaking up here and telling you that it's not going to work. If they want to try it down in Albany or if they want to give us the bosses. The scenario is not unusual. Dozens of New York school districts have seen voters reject buying school buses in the last two budget votes. In Rochester, Syracuse, Ithaca, on Long Island. What all those no votes mean is that one of the biggest barriers to enacting the electric school bus transition in New York could be the voting public, school district by school district. We have seen some of those votes go down. Um, So I I think that referendum component is going to be a challenge. Tom Burns is the BOCE superintendent for St. Lawrence and Lewis counties. He says the state's mandate approach has rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. It's just something that has to be done in collaboration with us and not done to us. New York Republican lawmakers have campaigned hard against the mandate and argued for a delayed date and a reworking of the legislation. But so far, no dice. It's important to note that there is a lot of federal and state grant money out there to buy these buses and pay for infrastructure. And most North Country districts are considered priority for that money. Byrne says the problem is that the burden still lies with districts to do the work. It's put districts in the position of having to fend for themselves and try to get information, try to compile data, try to do cost analyses. 
Now, some North Country districts have gotten a yes from their voters in Alexandria Bay, Malone, Governor, Clifton Fine. Norwood Norfolk Central School District got their electric bus as a gift from their bus supplier, Leonard Bus Sales, through a state incentive program. So they didn't have to hold a vote. They got it on the road last month. Superintendent Jamie Cruikshank says the bus is quiet and rides smoothly, but is losing charge a lot faster than they expected. That makes him nervous. We have multiple buses that run midday, whether it's two miles to Seaway Tech or maybe to pick up a foster child in in a district up to 50 miles away. This bus couldn't do that. Um, And if we had to transition 100 percent to all electric buses, we wouldn't function. BOCE Superintendent Tom Burns says in a transition as big as this one, the state would ideally be walking districts through it, step by step. They would build electrification plans for districts. NYSERDA, the state's energy agency, is in charge of the electric bus transition. A spokesperson told NCPR in a written statement that the agency is paying for electrification plans and currently working with over 200 districts on just that. It also pointed to the incentives and written guides they're providing. But there's still the voting problem. When it comes time to purchase an electric bus, BOCE Superintendent Burns says it's still up to the people. If voters say no, you can't buy a bus. You can't and, and you probably shouldn't, right? I mean, that it, it is part of our current structure for a reason. We are democratic institutions. We have locally elected boards. We adhere to state law. Back in Edwards Knox, Sean DeLorme Jr. plans to try again if the district gets a federal grant they've applied for. It would make an electric bus even cheaper, just $40,000. DeLorme says in that event, they'd bring the bus purchase back to the community for a special vote. And he's hoping it's an offer they can't refuse. And explain to them again, this is almost a free bus and what we have to do this. The law is not changing anytime soon. So would you rather spend 40 grand or 425? As the 2027 deadline nears, this will become a more frequent conundrum. And whether it's through more guidance, easier to access incentives or doubling down, the state and its schools will have to address it. Amy Feierizel, North Country Public Radio. This is NCPR. You're listening to Northern Light right here on North Country Public Radio. It's about 10 after 8. Good morning. I'm Monica Sandreski. So glad you could join us. Stick around. We have a preview of the Ottawa Jazz Festival, which continues through Sunday night. It's coming up in just a couple of minutes right here on Northern Light, which is supported by McFadden Deer Insurance in Canton, Potsdam, and Governor encouraging North Country residents to support local nonprofit organizations that provide services to those in need, mcfaddendeer.com. We do have a correction to issue. The two Democrats running in Plattsburgh's mayoral primary are Clinton County Legislator Wendell Hughes and County Assistant District Attorney Dan Lennon. Any write-in candidates must be registered Democrats. We had said that Iris Kane is running as a write-in candidate, but she is not a registered Democrat. And again, any write-in candidates must be registered Democrats. Music Now by Mark Corey out of Watertown. state will invest $16 million in education and history projects that highlight overlooked achievements in the black community. The state's Commission on African American History recommended the investments. Desiree DiOrio reports for the New York Public News Network. The funding will go to programs that teach the history of black New Yorkers, preserve historic and cultural heritage, and commemorate the state's abolition of slavery in 1827. 
Governor Kathy Hochul says some of the funding will be used for a ceremony in 2026 to observe the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the first captured Africans at New Amsterdam Harbor in downtown Manhattan. The commission report also recommends programs that boost economic development in the black community. Hochul released the report to coincide with Juneteenth, the federal holiday marking the end of slavery in 1865. For the New York Public News Network, I'm Desiree DiOrio. Queensbury's planning board has approved plans for a $10 million cannabis growing and processing site. The facility will grow, process, and distribute cannabis to dispensaries across the state. It was proposed by a company called Prime Arrow, which has already received a state distribution license. According to the Glens Falls Post-Star, the building will be located in the Queensbury Industrial Park, which Warren County has tried to develop mostly unsuccessfully for over 20 years. An Ogdensburg police officer is in stable condition after being shot by a fellow officer Thursday night. Ogdensburg police chief said in a press release that they believe the incident was unintentional. The shooting took place at the police station during a shift change. According to Watertown Daily Times, seven officers are on administrative leave while the county's sheriff's office investigates. Other law enforcement agencies will supplement Ogdensburg City police patrols while their officers are on leave. And the North Country is getting about $3 million to fight youth vaping. The money is part of a half a billion dollar settlement with leading e-cigarette maker Jewel Labs for marketing its vapes to teens. According to New York Attorney General Letitia James's office, the settlement is part of a multi-state settlement and the money will be split between counties and BOCES. They have to use the money for public education, cessation programs, and public health research on teens' e-cigarette use. Jefferson County received the most funding at over $500,000. Tourism is the economic lifeblood of the Adirondack Park. It's an industry with a bunch of moving parts, and one of those parts is social media marketing, which has become more and more important in the digital age. Today, we hear from an Adirondack influencer who's on a mission to promote businesses across the park and on social media. Anna Williams-Bergen has this North Country at Work story. Michelle Bartlett is from Alabama, a long way from the town of Old Forge that she now calls home. I tell people I'm not from the Adirondacks, but I got here as fast as I could. Bartlett loves the Adirondacks, and she just lights up when she talks about the area. It's always gorgeous. I've never seen an ugly day. I've seen a rainy day. I've seen a snowy day. I've seen a really hot day, black fly days. I've never seen an ugly one. It's always gorgeous in the Adirondacks. In the South, Bartlett worked in digital marketing and social media. When she moved to the Adirondacks about 10 years ago, she felt like businesses here were behind the times. I was walking around being a tourist, and then I realized that in the Adirondacks, they don't use their social media the way that they could. I thought they didn't understand how much money they're leaving on the table. So Bartlett started a Facebook page. She called it Life in the ADK, and she used it to chronicle the region as she got to know it. Now she's got over 100,000 followers across Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. She posts photos of sunsets, videos driving through Adirondack towns, and stops at local businesses, like in this TikTok. So we left Tupper Lake today and went on to Saranac Lake. You cannot go to Saranac Lake without stopping at Donnelly's, at least not if you're with my husband. Her comments are flooded with people reminiscing on trips to the Adirondacks or looking forward to their next visit. Social media was going so well that she started an online store in 2016, and two years later, she opened a brick-and-mortar one in Old Forge. Gift shops like hers can be a tough business because of just how seasonal Adirondack tourism is. But Bartlett said it's not hard for her. And I think it's because I have the social media. So during tourist season, we do tourist season. But during the shoulder season, I can still make income because I have the online store. Bartlett says she loves running the gift shop. She gets to meet people from all over and bond over the place they both love. A lot of the people who come in follow her on social media. But that's not my passion. My passion is to help other small businesses have a killer season every year, no matter what Mother Nature's throwing at us. And that's where the app comes in. The app. It's called Life in the ADK, and it's like a 21st century version of one of those travel guidebooks. Bartlett started it at the request of her followers. 
Over the years, she was constantly getting asked for recommendations. What to do, what to eat, where to stay in towns across the Adirondacks. So Bartlett wanted to take all that info and put it in one place. So when you click on any town, I've listed every place to eat, every place to stay, all the things to do, every place to shop, all the local hikes, where you take your dog if it gets sick, your car if it breaks down, where's the laundromat in that town, the bank in that town, the church in that town, what events are going on in that town. Bartlett paid for the app to be developed, and she released it a couple months ago. Right now, it's averaging about 125 downloads a day. She puts all the businesses in a town on it, and everyone gets one free ad, too. She says there was no point in making a whole app just for herself when everyone could benefit from it. The Adirondack is a community, and, and it's not easy to live in the Adirondacks, especially year-round. And so the app, to me, is just one way of trying to make it as easy for those of us who live there all year-round as possible. Bartlett calls her app the Chamber of Commerce for the entire park. Anybody who has a business, that's the goal, is to have every Adirondack business thrive as much as possible. Now Bartlett says her job is to drive all over the park, letting business owners know about the app and filming content for her social media. For North Country Public Radio's North Country at Work project, I'm Anna Williams-Bergen in Boonville. This story was recorded at a North Country at Work event in Boonville. If you want to share your work story, we've got another event coming up. Come tell us your work story in Elizabethtown at the Adirondack History Museum. North Country at Work team will be there coming up Wednesday, July 17th from 11 until 4 o'clock. That's the Adirondack History Museum in Elizabethtown on July 17th from 11 until 4. Come tell your story. This is NCPR. You're listening to Northern Light right here on North Country Public Radio. It's about 20 after 8. Good morning. I'm Monica Sandreski. So glad you could join us. Coming up in just a minute, we've got a preview of the Ottawa Jazz Festival, which is underway now and runs through Sunday. Then stick around after the show for Bird Note coming up at 842. But first, here's a look at the weather forecast. At last check, it was 67 degrees in Lake George, 70 degrees in Plattsburgh, 63 degrees in Lake Placid, 67 in Lowville, and 66 degrees in Malone. We can expect mostly sunny skies today, with temperatures rising into the upper 70s to about 80 degrees uh, by this afternoon. Overnight tonight, scattered showers expected with lows in the mid-60s. Tomorrow, scattered showers are expected to continue a little bit cooler, but not too much. Highs in the mid-70s expected. On Thursday, rain showers likely with highs in the 60s. And on Friday, mostly sunny skies with highs around 70 degrees. The massive Montreal Jazz Festival kicks off this Thursday. But if you're wary of huge crowds but still looking for a musical adventure, you might want to check out the Ottawa Jazz Festival, which runs through this Sunday. It features dozens of artists on four stages in downtown Ottawa and at venues around the city. This year's headliners include Nora Jones, Levy, Lake Street Dive, and Ali Dimiola. Peter Kankura is the festival festival's artistic director and now its new executive director. He also plays saxophone and he told David Summerstein that one of this year's artists in residence playing multiple shows is guitarist and bassist Charlie Hunter. Charlie Hunter is one of the most singular musicians I know and that's largely because He plays this instrument that he currently calls the big six. I mean it's only a six string like a guitar but the top uh, three strings are bass strings, and the bottom three strings are guitar strings, Um, which is also not that uncommon, but Charlie's ability to play that as though it's two separate people is just uncanny. Uh, Even when he plays just bass or just guitar, his groove and sense of time are unbelievable, which is why 
He ended up on like D'Angelo's Voodoo record, right? Oh, that, that's, that's like one of the groove records and Charlie Hunter's all over that. And he, it's also all about sort of authenticity. There's just no fluff, right? It's all just real music making, right? And, you, and you've, you've done an album with him. I have done two albums with him. the other uh, big draws uh, this year at the festival? I see Leve is Leve is going to be a huge one for people. It's huge. It's huge. Don't you notice how I get quiet when there's no one else around me and you and awkward silence don't you Lebe, uh, we booked her last year at the Ezraeli studio at the NAC, which was a 300-seat theater. And at that point, uh, she was routed. I didn't really know much about her. Um, although I looked at, you know, she had 100,000 Instagram followers, and I was like, well, uh, we can't really lose on that. And uh, so so we did that, and that, that sold out in a couple of days. So I just offered the, the agent uh, another night. Uh, and that sold out in a day. So after the festival, we just said, let's put her on the main stage. So we locked that in really early. It's the only time ever that we've actually sold out the park. Like even even Willie Nelson, Aretha Franklin, nobody's actually sold out the park except for Lebe. <laughs> It's uh, it's going to be a huge night, and most of those most of those folks that bought tickets are uh, their youth passes, so they're young folks, which is incredible, right? I think it's such a, a great way to uh, enter the jazz realm and and be introduced to the jazz festival. Tell us about uh, an artist that maybe we don't know that we should know. Ooh, there's a number of those. Uh, one is on our last night of the festival, actually closing out the festival, is Yusuf Days. Uh, and this is a drummer, right, from London. He's just creating waves. Sounds great. That's going to be amazing. It's still kind of under the radar, including... And so we have this late night series where a lot we put a lot of stuff like that. That could be danceable, is... Um, you know, maybe not sit down jazz, but it's hip, right? So, uh, Butcher Brown, Hunter Tones are on that stage. of the, the the staff that are that are seasonal with us are younger and they're um, you know music enthusiasts and all of them have said from the entire lineup what they've walked away with is, is adding a whole bunch of use of days to their playlist he collaborates with the right people he's open-minded with that he's all about the black culture he's he's kind of the real deal and he's making a wave and people are listening so it's it's an important artist right now. What do you think the role of a jazz festival is today? Um, even though there are more younger artists like Leve, like Yusuf Days, like Kamasi Washington, who are bringing jazz to new ears and younger ears. I think a lot of people still think of jazz as being very sort of niche and segmented. What role does does a jazz festival like the Ottawa Jazz Festival play in, you know, challenging people's notions about that? Jazz is such a broad term at this point. 
can mean so many different things. I mean, there's a whole bunch of retro jazz, like swing and Western swing and early jazz. Then there's this whole hip hop end of jazz. Then there's still modern jazz, like Chris Potter, right? There's so many, there's so many worlds of that are all valid as jazz and you can't possibly book them all so within that we really do try to just tell um kind of a story right and program as authentic music as we possibly can you'll find your way tomorrow or today there's nothing else i can say to ease your mind i think the role of our festival is is to hopefully peep 